Big Tech Show has landed in Rwanda. I'll be speaking with tech giants Soko Watch, CC Hub, and Tap and Go. Who is first on my list? Keep watching to find out. It's one of those days with an unpredictable weather in Rwanda, but I'm not going to let that stop me. Today, I'll be speaking to Patrick Musana, who is the country manager of Soko Watch Rwanda. Soko Watch is an e commerce and logistics startup that is pioneering the use of electric tuk-tuks. Many of you from Lagos know it as Kekenapep. My name is Benjamin. Keep watching The Big Tech Show. Soko Watch. Yes. What does it mean? Yes. Uh, so let's just start with that first uh, part of the word, Soko. Uh, Soko is a Swahili word um, that translates to market. Um, in Rwanda, just add an I at the beginning of the word, it becomes Isoko. Um, and Isoko itself has two different meanings in Kinyarwanda. Um, one being market, um, just like in Swahili, the other uh, definition being a source, um, so a source of something. So Soko Watch is, uh, and we're aiming to be the one-stop source of everything for, for our merchants and for our different partners. Um, nice. So that is the meaning. Nice, nice, nice. And I also learned that, like, you know, the watch, the watch, or how does... Yes, watch. Uh, so so in, in Rwanda, the, the, the word for hours um, is watchu, you watchu. Um, so when you put the word together, Soko Watch, uh, it translates to our market. So that is how our merchants see us. They see us as their market. So that is that is Soko Watch. If you speak a little bit more about the, you know, solution that Soko Watch provides, right? yes. who are you serving? And you know. yes. Uh, so our core customers right now are these small neighborhood dukas. Okay. Um, these dukas are really serving about eighty percent of the population. Dukas, is that like uh, these, uh, yes, the small shop. Uh, that is the word for it. Uh, it also applies in the different regions as well. They call them dukas. Um, so those are core customers right now. Um, so we are B2B. Um, right now, the, the solution that Sokowatch is offering, um, previously uh, a shop would have to, let's say if you need to re-up um, your inventory, you'd have to close down, hire a vehicle, um, go to town, go to all these different suppliers, load up and then go back to your shop. So this whole time you've had to close down, yeah, uh, so you've revenue. lost revenue. Yeah. Um, so what Soko Watch is doing is, you know, you sit, you stay where you are, um, order through our app and you can call in, you can text us, uh, and then we'll get the goods to you the same day, free of charge. Um, so that is quite the, the, the value proposition for, for these shops because you're saving them time, you're saving them money. Nice. Uh, what, what do you think has been the biggest need Apart from the fact that maybe access to this more inventory, right, what do you think is the biggest need of your retailers? In this case, your customers. Right, what, do you, what do they want the most, and why are they using Soko Watch for it? Reliability, I'd say, is the, is the biggest uh, need um, right now. Uh, the, the, the market sector is really fragmented; it's, it's quite huge. Uh, but re reliability, both in service and uh, all the different products that we offer, is the key. Uh, I guess a key need uh, for the merchants. So the fact that we are able to tell them these are our prices, we'll keep these prices for you, or you know, if you put in an order at this time, we'll deliver same day for free. Um, so that reliability, like that customer yeah. service, is really the the big the, the biggest difference uh, in terms of what Soko Watch is offering and these other companies are. Of course, we you know we're also offering other products such as credit. So all those are supplementary uh, products that are drawing the customers to us because, okay. again, reliability in, in terms of our services. Okay, so w walk me through a customer journey, right? So say I'm a Duka. Yes. And I want to get Soko Watch to get me goods. How do I go about it? Sure. Um, so we, we have uh, a sales rep uh, team. Uh, but their job is to generate those orders. Uh, so uh, during the day, they'll go out to the field, you know, do a field visit, uh, visit a few shops, all the different shops. They onboard a customer. They tell them about the services that we offer, offer testimonials from different uh, uh, other basically merchants that we've worked with. Um, so once the customer is onboarded, added into the, our system, we know their location, we know 
you know, their, their contacts, all of that. Uh, whenever a customer wants to put in an order, they'll usually start in the morning, they'll put in a, they'll either order through our app, they'll send a text message, or they'll call one of the, uh, the agents assigned to their routes. Um, once the customer's put in an order, so let's say he wants five bags of sugar, uh, five jerkins of oil, uh, the order is immediately booked into our system uh, for tracking, and then it's assigned to an agent. That agent then brings their vehicle to the warehouse, they load up, um, then they're dispatched to the field. Um, and then once they've delivered uh, the, the, the products, uh, they collect cash on hand or digital payment, uh, mobile money. Then at the end of the day, the, 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 the agent will come back and uh, do a cash reconciliation and a stock reconciliation. And that is the, the, that is the whole process, uh, yeah, basically. I find that model interesting because in a traditional e-commerce model, um, sorting happens before, you know, either assigning to a delivery um, person. Mm. But here, immediately someone places an order, um, it's assigned to a sales rep or an agent who then fulfills that Exactly. That, uh, it's that, 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 makes that it, it makes it more efficient for us. Yeah. Um, and, and then th those agents, by serving the same customers, they're, they're building that relationship okay. uh, with the customer themselves. So that is why we, we have that model. Okay, so, so in general, like how many agents do what restaurants or retailers? Right now, we, are, so we, we have 2,200 uh, customers that we serve. Uh, we, we've barely stretched, uh, scratched the surface. Uh, we, we think we're about at 20% in terms of the Kigali market. Okay. Uh, and it's constantly growing. Uh, list of customers is growing. We're getting referrals from customers themselves okay. who've enjoyed our services. Uh, so yeah, it's been growing significantly. We're really proud of the work. Um, okay. the, the so so let's, let's back up to you know, the Kigali market, like the industry. Yes. Right? Um, how many people are in Kigali? What's the mobile penetration in Kigali? Um, and how do you see advancements in technology and payments in you know, helping you fulfill your mission? Sure. Uh, Kigali itself has a population of around 2 million. Okay. Uh, uh, smartphone penetration is still low. We're still around 40%, okay. uh, which is not, you know, we, we but even that 40% has been, uh, we've seen tremendous growth the past few years. So okay. uh, we, we are happy with the, uh, the, the changes that we're seeing. Um, in terms of what technology can help us, uh, everything, um, you know, everything we do is through technology, is technology enabled. So we also want to see that uh, made available to our customers. So that's also something that we're doing uh, through our smartphone financing program. Um, we're trying to make sure that our customers can be self-reliable, can basically go through the whole customer journey on their own and feel that sense of ownership and just, you know, also improve the way they manage their inventory. Um, so, so the, the technology is playing a big key, uh, and we think it's what's going to unlock the potential of all these shops. Okay. Uh, so we, we're quite excited with the way it's going. So, so when it comes to the way they pay, um, what, what solution is their preferred um, way of payments? Yes. Uh, so previously, uh, before the, the pandemic, um, ca cash was king, uh, though the government was putting a big push in, uh, in terms of mobile payments, uh, mobile money payments. Um, and with the pandemic, that, uh, I guess, uh, was an opportunity uh, for the government to really push uh, mobile payments. And we've seen quite a big change. Uh, for us, it's really beneficial in terms of the fact that um, it's easier to track. Uh, it's a lot more secure because agents are not walking around with bags of cash. Though our streets are very safe, it's always good uh, to, 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 you know, to go the extra mile. So even for the customers themselves, um, it's, it's easier to, to handle uh, mobile money payments. Um, it's also safer for themselves. Uh, you know, when their shops are vandalized, cash is not something that they have to worry about. Uh, so mobile payments have really unlocked a lot. And, and we think that, you know, we're barely scratching the surface with that. Okay, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and in this case, it's not going to be like Kenya's M-Pesa. So who no. is, what's the equivalent of M-Pesa here? Right now, I'd say the equivalent is uh, MTN Mobile Money. Okay. Um, they, they, they are the leader. They have 60% of the, uh, the market, though Airtel is giving them a, quite a, a good fight. Uh, so we do want to see more competitors. We want to see yes. more. Uh, companies really join in on this because there's still a lot of opportunity um, uh, in Kigali, I'd say. Okay. Um, so f from a maybe strategic or policy point of view, um, are there specific things the government has done or is doing to improve commerce, startups, and you know how they do business in Rwanda? 
Yeah, 100%. Uh, the, the, the government is really behind this. Uh, the, the, the government has pushed for uh, technology to really be embedded in every sector. Yeah. Okay. You'll find that uh, most government services, you can get them through you know, a website or Idembo is a good, good example where most government services, certificates that you need, you, every now, everybody now has access to it. You don't have to physically be somewhere. Um, so the government is pushing it a lot. Um, through the, the National Bank, they're also starting a Rwanda, Rwanda Innovation Fund. And this is supposed to help you know, startups uh, have access to capital a lot easier. They're creating you know, you know, these, uh, these tech hubs to supposed to nurture the talent. Uh, so there's a big push. Um, and the government does see this as, uh, as um, a uh, big uh, sector as, as somewhere, you know, as, uh, I would say Kigali wants to center itself as at least as a regional leader in terms of, uh, uh, you know, fintech and uh, right. in this I industry. That's, that's going to be a long way to go, especially if they need to first cover internet penetration. Yes, yeah. it, there's a long way to go. But, uh, you know, Rwanda, just like Sokowatch, is, is quite an ambitious country. Um, so I do think, you know, we'll get there. Okay. Uh, yeah. You use tech to sell to your customers. Do your customers use that same tech to sell to their end consumers? Mm, I would say most of them do not, uh, but that is where that's that's a gap that Sokowatch is hoping to, to bridge in, in terms of how to help those shops embed technology as well into what they're doing to be, help them become more you know self reliable to where they can do all these things on their own. Um, so it's it's not there yet, but okay. it's something that we're working on for sure. Thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been an amazing conversation. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Hi, my name is Patrick Musana. I'm the country manager here at Soka Watch Rwanda. You're watching The Big Take Show, brought to you by Accelerate TV and the AFF. <laughs>have such a beautiful space here in Design Lab Rwanda. Thank you. Um, what goes on here? Uh, so the Design Lab is really the research and development arm of CC Hub. Okay. Um, and so basically we're focused on the application of design thinking in creating technology solutions. But also being a tech innovation organization, part of our work is how do we exploit technology to improve products and processes. And finally for us, it's also about building partnerships and networks to collaborate um, and address social challenges on the continent. When you say design thinking, it seems like all this MIT speak. Yep. What, what, what does that mean or how does it apply? How do you guys use it? Yeah, so human-centered design methodology is really where you start with the end user in mind. So a lot of times when people are you know, creating solutions, they come to you with a challenge. It's really easy to throw the solution based on just the little information you have. But okay. with design thinking, what we're doing is we're starting with who we're solving for. They're part of the process from start to finish. Um, the relevant stakeholders are also involved in the process. So we do discovery, which is research. Okay. You know, we frame the challenge because while you're identifying the gaps, you figure out that maybe what you thought was the problem wasn't really the problem through our research. We reframe this. We come up with how might we statements, which is now an opportunity for us to co-create solutions together with the end user in mind. So there is buying from the beginning. Okay. You test it, you improve upon it, and when you implement and you hand off a solution, um, there's not only is there buy-in, but there's chances of sustainability and long-term. So you're head of programs. Yes, right? I am. What, what, what does that entail with respect to Design Lab and CC Hub? So the way we, because a lot of our programs are incorporated in design thinking how we work. So it doesn't matter who we're working with, we're making sure that the end users are part of the problem. The relevant stakeholders are part of it from the beginning. There's buy-in from them. So we start to make sure that all the projects or programs we work on incorporate that process in there. And being part of the design lab, that's really why I'm here as well. Okay, so you oversee um, programs or what is a program to like CC Hub? What was what, a program? I mean, it really depends on what we're solving for. Um, okay. It could be from capacity building and putting together a capacity building plan mm -hmm. for a corporate organization. It could be really, because for us this year, we're all about social impact and addressing challenges on the continent. And it doesn't have to be something a client comes to us for. So say for instance, you know, we see a problem somewhere in public health. Okay. As a design lab, we just create one from there. We create a project, we try to solve the problem there. And usually sometimes what then happens is a client will notice that and want to partner with us. Um, but a lot of times we just all about solving problems using technology and incorporating design thinking in the process. You know, you said about design thinking, um, social impact. 
what kind of people work here? Like what skill sets are needed to work out of you know, CC of Design Lab? So Design Lab is made of a, of a multidisciplinary team okay. of researchers, so data analysts, but we also have our engineers here, so you know, developers are here as well, and designers as well, which is UI, UX, but also human-centered designers as well. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the team that makes up, up the Design Lab. And so we, like, with what we do with design thinking, our researchers are part of the discovery phase. Okay. But say, being a tech organization, innovation organization as well, when we need to build products or, or solutions, our engineers do that as well. Okay, so how, how does that building process happen, right? And you know, how is this sustainable? How does it become sustainable? So you find a problem, mm -hmm. you probably spend money to do your research. Mm -hmm. um, when you're building the tech solution, you, you know, like how, how do you fund that process? It depends on what we're working on. So okay. some of our work is with clients who come to us with a need okay. that we work with them through. Um, and some of that need, some of that will lead to a pro an actual product or okay. a solution. And sometimes, like I said, it's just we believe in addressing challenges. We don't need to wait till we have the funds. So a lot of times, internally, we start Fund it, yeah. and we start working on it. And that then becomes a bigger project that someone else decides to fund afterwards. Okay. So it could be either or, okay. really. Yeah. So, so are there like some examples of these projects you've worked on, either for clients or, you know, your own products? Yeah. I mean, of course. Uh, with our focus areas being public health, education, and governance, we've done a series of really exciting work here. Um, one is Name Care. Um, so, with our collaboration and our partnership with the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research in Lagos, we basically created a, date, a digital tool to help tuberculosis patients be able to take and adhere to their treatments. And how did that start? Um, people were always coming into the Naima Center to get. Uh, their medication for TB and some will not come because of transportation right. um, so it was just there was a lot of inconsistency with the data that was being collected there were people who tested and we couldn't reach out to them um, to come back and you know get medication so we created this tool that literally from your home you can and you're with your phone you can take a video of you taking your medication we match you with the caregiver which is a doctor who can decide to approve or not approve based on how you take it you check, you know, you, it counts down for you, you know, your medications, what time you should be taking it every day, when you should come in and not come in. Yeah. If we don't hear from you, your caregiver can call you directly straight from the app to make sure that, you know, to check up on you and see how you're doing. And so we created a medical trial around that just to be able to sort of build, use technology to address a problem with not just data that was being collected, mm -hmm. but also how do we sort of make the experience better for the patient. That sounds very really interesting. Um, did you guys do anything in line with, you know, COVID-19, maybe trying to solve something that was going on? Absolutely. We did. So like I said, we're, because we're all about innovation and we don't really wait for funds or anything, it's just if we believe in it. When COVID started, we were like, how can we play and how can we help solve the problem? So with NIMA as well, we created a COVID practice management system and that helped with the testing. So they were test, there was a testing set at NIMA. And we wanted to sort of automate that process of reporting a case, triaging, and communicating your test results. So you go on the, you know, on the platform, you, write, you, put, you put your information in, and of course we're able to make sure that your information is valid because we're also trying to improve data integrity. Um, and then of course, based on that, we prioritize high-risk uh, patients. We have them come to the, you know, give them an appointment, okay. uh, come into the test center, they take their tests, they go back. We can communicate that with them through the platform as well. Does the lab, yeah. is it open to the public, right? Um, for instance, can a student or any young person trying to build a product, you know, walk into the lab, come and make use of the electricity, the internet, is it open? So it's not a co-working space per se, okay. um, but a lot of what we also do, besides the fact that we have a lot of design sessions here. So we hold a lot of design sessions with corporate organizations or, you know, public health agencies, whatever it is we're trying to address. So we do have people come in for design okay. sessions. We also do a designer hangout, which is also a way of community engagement where young people who are designers can come in. And we, it's a Friday night, we just really talk about challenges that we want to solve using design thinking process as well. But it really depends on, again, what we're working on. Um, okay. So it's not like you can just come in and use our space with internet and you know power, but if there are ideas you have or if there's um, an, an area of challenge and you're interested in sort of using the process to address it, okay. that's what we're here for. Okay, okay, because I definitely would like to come and, and work out of this space. Um, 
how did CCUP decide on, like maybe Rwanda, for instance? You yeah. know, um, why didn't you do a design lab in Nairobi or in Congo? <laughs> So, I mean, every time people ask me and they come here, the first thing I would say is, have you seen this place? Wow. Um, Rwanda is just really beautiful. Um, but also, they've sort of created an ecosystem that is, inspires creativity. Okay. Um, and they've invested a lot in, in sort of creating an enabling environment for technologists and innovation, both foreign and local. So the ease of doing business is really here. And so for us, we were looking for a place that would not only just deepen and broaden our opportunity to sort of collaborate with, you know, across, across sectors, you know, on the continent. And Rwanda gave us that opportunity. I mean, and it's just allowed. Because a lot of our work, I say a lot of our work is, is up here. Yeah. And so you need a place that allows you to just kind of have that, inspire that energy and yeah. that creativity. And Rwanda gives us that. Right, without having to worry about traffic and exactly. or all of the other things. Don't worry about traffic, don't worry about power and all that stuff. So. so for instance, during the launch two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, we had representatives from the government yeah. who came to, to the launch event. Yeah. And in my head, that just signals a lot of um, collaboration mm -hmm. between the government and the people here. Are there some policies you've noticed that the Rwandan government has put in place that enable startup and tech businesses thrive? Like I said, they're, they're very open. There's a lot of investment that has been done with regards to innovation and technology. Rwanda is really embracing that aspect. Um, and so they embrace, they, they allow for organizations that are here to, that are improving technology or innovating in some capacity. Um, and so the ease of doing business, like I said earlier, is part of why we're here. And having you know the Minister of ICT and Innovation be a part of this, and the now CEO of the Development Bank of Rwanda be a part of that, allowed us to sort of, it allowed us to know that they were ready and receptive to what we're trying to do. And even prior to that, the conversations we're having with them was part of why we came out here. They are all for innovation and technology on the continent and pushing that agenda. Do you reckon that there'll be some challenges that people who are trying to build a business in Rwanda might face? You know, maybe unanticipated? I mean, not that I think of. Just learn the language when you're coming, if you can. <laughs> um, but no, they've been very warm and welcoming, very receptive. You know, a lot of investment is going into, I mean, as small as Rwanda is, it seems, they are charging when it comes to technology innovation on the continent and, and being the example. You know, if you're talking about capacity, yes, compared to countries like Nigeria or Kenya, yes. Yeah. But part of that receptiveness and that openness to a technologist and innovation in the country is also helping build their capacity locally mm. as well. So that collaboration with both foreign and local is yeah. part of what helps to get this, to get to them to that place that they're that they aspire to be. So I mean, what are some of the exciting things that we might be hearing from Design Lab soon? Um, one is the, the digital epidemiology project okay. and so what that is is how do we use unlikely data like social media data really to help in monitoring the surveillance of diseases and and it was very evident because of the covid right. and so that's something that we are excited about and passionate about we are building an african digital epidemiology network actually currently and it is just basically working with you know epidemiologists on the continent to sort of how do we come up with how do we use this data that we have to be able to help us address and monitor diseases on the continent Okay. Um, also, even though, our public, even though our focus areas are public health, education, and governance, um, we're also really, we also like to branch out sometimes. And so one of our current projects actually is a ditch plastic project. And it's really built, it's a network of academics, uh, policymakers, but also, you know, digital innovators. And our goal is really how do we utilize innovation, digital innovation, um, to transition to a more circular plastic economy. So basic, on the continent specifically. So how we make sure that we are managing our plastic waste. Okay. Um, even for that, we have an extruder in the office, which we're gonna be using to showcase how you can take your plastic waste, shred it, and create filaments. Right. Um, and then use 3D printing to create other products from it. So it's really stuff we're excited about. Coming it's, it sounds really interesting. It is. I'd like to try it out or just see if that's work. Uh, we have a filament you can see. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tommy Jayala. I'm the head of programs at CC Hub. You're watching The Big Tech Show, brought to you by Accelerate TV and AFF. Wow, what a day. Spent today speaking to the country manager of Soko Watch Rwanda, Patrick Musana, as well as a time with head of programs at CC Hub Design Lab Rwanda, Tommy Jayala. Where would The Big Tech Show take me next? Keep watching to find out. Thank you.